Boom, 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 degeneracy. Uh, so what is degeneracy? Degeneracy is when a quantum state... Uh, sorry, let me say a... When two or more eigenfunctions have the same eigenvalue. So some of you may have heard degener degeneracy before with respect to quantum or electronics when we say that you know, two electrons have the same energy level. And that's because we know that energy is an eigenvalue, and that means that we have two electrons, each with, a different, uh, each with the same energy, but with a different eigenfunction or a different wave function. Uh, Hybridization is a form of degeneracy, and that's because there, well, there's three ways to have degeneracy. Uh, one is from symmetry, and that's where hybridization comes from. Around atoms, you know, the behavior in the x, the y, and the z directions uh, are the same. Well, assuming that it's a, a spherical potential, which atoms in isolation are. Uh, <clears throat> second is through exchange. which is something we'll talk about, and I find that this is why it is my favorite lecture. And the third is accidental. So these are the, the three forms of degeneracy. Uh, let's start with symmetry. So imagine a particle in an infinite box, again, uh, a box with infinite potential on the outside. But this time, let's say that it's a two-dimensional box. Well, you have a two-dimensional two -dimensional, uh, particle in a box. We'll have a box that's infinite out here. We'll call this our x direction. We'll call this up our y direction. And our box will have lengths L sub x in the x direction, and we'll have length L sub y in the y direction. <coughs> now, this gives us a Hamiltonian, which is px squared over 2m plus y squared over 2m plus bx plus by. And this means that we can break our Hamiltonian into a Hamiltonian of x components and a Hamiltonian of y components. <laughs> And if you take this and you substitute it in the, the Schrodinger equation and you solve it, you're going to find eigenfunctions, and one and two. We have two quantum numbers now. That are beta sine. Actually, I'm going to call these nx and ny. x pi over lx x sine n y pi over l y y. And we're going to find eigenvalues e and x and y that are h bar squared over 2m and x pi over lx quantity squared plus h bar over 2m and y 
pi over L y quantity squared. So this is our solution to the Schrodinger uh, time independent uh, eigen problem. And if Lx equals Ly, then E plus alpha beta is equal to E beta alpha, but phi alpha beta is not equal to phi beta alpha. Basically, we were saying that you can have a wave function that does say, let's say this, or this, these two have the same energy, but they have different quantum solutions because they're rotated 90 degrees from each other. So these are Those are symmetrically equivalent uh, solutions, but strictly speaking, they're different. So we have two uh, degenerate uh, energies. And, uh, questions about this? Same energy, different. You said they were the same energy, but they had different what? Different uh, functions. functions. So if you think about this thing, uh, you know, x, y, x, y. In this case, you've got a bunch of nodes in the x direction, and in this case, you've got a bunch of nodes in the y direction. These two have the same energies, but spatially, the solution is distributed differently. The, the function is different, but the energy is the same. The uh, eigenfunction, the eigenvalue is the same, but the eigenfunction is different. And you said quantum solutions, so that's more related to when we're thinking about um, degeneracy in the chemistry, right? Yes. In chemistry, it's different. I would say that I haven't taken quantum chemistry, just you know, read uh, articles and, and things, and my only experience when people talk about degeneracy in uh, chemistry is that it has to do with symmetry. For example, the uh, uh, px, py, and pz directions are all, they're different functions, because one is in the x, one is the y, one is the z, but they have the same energy states. This is um, <clears throat> symmetry. Now let's get into some more questions about this. I have a little more math in the notes that I, I didn't show on the board. Because math is great. But we're conserving markers here. Uh, OK, so let's talk about exchange. Well, I've got 10 minutes here, so let me actually skip exchange and go to accidental, because accidental is really short. They're degenerate by accident. End of story. I mean, it, it happens sometimes. It happens sometimes when two you know, wave functions or two eigenfunctions they just happen to have the same energy. Uh, it's not particularly common, but it does happen. OK, let's talk about exchange now. And exchange is the one that I think is really neat. So in the next you know, 10 minutes, I'll talk about exchange. And then uh, in the next lecture, we'll talk about the implications of it. So let's do two non-interacting particles 
in 1D in a 1D box. And this box is going to have infinite potentials outside again. So we have some picture that looks like And we've got a particle here, and we've got a particle here. Our Hamiltonian is T1 plus P1, X plus T2 plus P2, <coughs> X. Right? They're separable, again. They're not interacting. So these potentials, they don't ever see each other. And each of these. Each H1 and H2 solve to E and X is equal to square root of 2 over L sine N pi X over L. So I should specify that our box is length L, it's being quantized, and they each have energies E sub N is equal to H bar squared over 2 M N pi over L squared. Now, we solve these uh, separately, but we write them to get together, and we saw that in the, the uh, symmetry part, that our wave function, our eigenfunction, n1, n2, x1, x2, is equal to 2 over L sine n1 pi x1 over L sine n2 pi x2 over L. And in this way of writing, that means particle 1 with quantum number n1 and particle 2 with quantum number n2 so that's what I mean by saying n1, n2. If I switch n1 and n2, then I would say particle 1 with n2 and particle 2 with n1. Uh, and this way of expressing position, I'm saying that particle 1 at x1, particle 2 at x2. Again, I'm using the order to specify you know, which particle it is, and the, what I'm writing down specifies which position or which, which number they have. Okay. And now our energies can be written. E, N1, N2 is equal to H bar squared over 2 M1, N1, pi over L squared plus h bar squared over 2 m2 n2 pi over l. So n1, n2 means particle 1 with quantum number n1, particle 2 with quantum number n2. Uh, these m's, those are masses. So these particles, they could have different masses. Now, if they have different masses, then uh, they're two different particles. There's no degeneracy. But if m1 equals m2, we're just going to call that you know, m, now it becomes degenerate. And it's degenerate due to exchange. And Why is that? Uh, this has to do with the loss of determinism. And, and by that, I mean that 
in a classical picture, if I said to you, this is what you've got, you've got uh, orange again. I've got x1 and x2 with n1 and n2. And let's say I know the momentum, you know, p1 and p2. I look at it, turn away, I look back, I know how much time's turned, and I know that these have moved some position. We have a deterministic picture. But that's not what we have in the quantum world. In the quantum world, what we have is we have a box. And I have L. And I might say you've got a particle here and a particle there. But I don't tell you actually I've got a particle there and a there and there, because you don't know with absolute certainty. What you know is you know the wave function, you know the wave function may be centered there, but it's actually spread out throughout the box. And this wave function, it may be centered here, but it's spread out throughout the box. And if, you know, by some coincidence, you know, you have the capacity to look at it and say, okay, that's particle one, that's particle two. You turn around, you look back. You don't know that anymore because the wave functions are overlapping. So at any point, both part one and two are present. So what it means is that at any point, we actually have this superposition of, of particles. Now, going back to our, our solution over here, uh, we can say that the n1, n2, and the n2, n1, you can switch n1 and n2 at any point in time, the same, have the same energy, regardless if you switch n1 and n2. And this is how exchange leads to degeneracy. Because we've lost that, you know, deterministic uh, worldview. Yes. So if they had different masses, then we would be able to tell exactly. where they are. Exactly. So if you have two particles that is either they're both electrons, right? You can't tell them apart. Now, exchange is actually a remarkably profound concept. So I like to talk more about exchange and, and what the implications are of that today. Questions about degeneracy? Okay. My, my notation a little bit because uh, it's going to become kind of cumbersome. Uh, so let's let's say that we can write a wave function. I want to call that psi. I want to list these as q1, q2, dot dot dot, dot qi, dot dot dot, qj, dot dot dot, q. Capital N for this. So 
this is a wave function. This represents a system of n non-interacting particles. wave function. Each of these cues, each of these cues represent a collection of variables and quantum numbers that represent a particle. So Q is a uh, And then the order that I write them in tells you which particle it is. So for example, this will be the eighth uh, particle. So this, this way, I'm able to concisely represent which particle we have and the state that that particle is in. <clears throat> okay, so we've got this expression. So now let's identify an operator, and we'll call this operator the interchange operator. comes first. So we know that Pij and Hamiltonian commute. Another thing that we know is we know that it's an operator. It operates and as such uh, it's a good 
operator in these quantum systems because the uh, wave function here is the same as the wave function for the energy, which means that it has to satisfy that Pij operating on some wave function psi returns uh, psi psi. It has to return an eigenvalue. Right? So we know that each one of these operators, if it's a good operator that can work in our, our uh, Hilbert space, it has to obey this as well. So something that we know is that we know that if I take and I operate once on this, it <coughs> swaps them. If I operate a second time, Pij, that puts Pij here. And that means that operating a second time returns the original value q1, q2, qi, qj, qn. So this means that pij, pij psi is equal to squared psi is equal to 1 psi, which means that psi squared is equal to 1, or our eigenvalue is equal to the plus or minus 1. It has to be one of those two values, because we know that operating twice brings it back. this case, we give these names and we say that we say the wave function is symmetric if the eigenvalue is plus one and it is anti-symmetric under exchange. <clears throat> so that's uh, the definition of a symmetric and anti-symmetric uh, wave function. Uh, it's also worth noting that Even though each, each version of the interchange operator is commutes with Hamiltonian, IJPLM, they don't necessarily commute with each other. Is that second one meant to have hat? Uh, yeah, half. So it's not universally true that for any uh, exchange that the two are equivalent. <clears throat> and, and this is important because this is going to limit, uh, well, you'll see in, in a moment here, that this is going to limit the way that we can express the wave functions. So let's define another operator. Let's, I need any 
read this? No, I don't. define an operator big P as the permutation operator. And this permutation operator is a Be a series of these interchange operators. So you can you know, have you know, five, six, seven you know, n ex exchanges that, that go on. <clears throat> well, that will give us P. Operating on the wave function q1, q2, qn, psi, q, is p1, is p. Let's call it one prime, q, two prime, da da da, q. N prime. Because it operates, which means that it returns a new wave function with these all, all scattered up into different uh, ordering. If P operator contains an even number of swaps, then we call it an even uh, permutation. Else, and if it has an odd number of permutations, we would call it uh, we call it uh, an odd permutation. Uh, and it's worth noting that. Uh, there exists n factorial permutations. So we've got a bunch of these that are, are available to us. And what's more, these permutation operators, they're not going to commute with each other. And that's because we know that the interchange operators don't commute with each other. And, and this is a problem. And, and the reason that this is a problem is because uh, because is Hamiltonian and P1, you know, some particular permutation, but not P2, some other permutation. And that doesn't make sense, right? It doesn't make sense that the wave function is an eigenstate of the Hamiltonian and a permutation, but then it can't be an eigenstate of the other permutation. And what that does is it 
means that the nature of the wave function is now limited. And what it limits it to is it means that we have to express our wave function in such a way that it is either totally symmetric or totally anti-symmetric. <clears throat> And by that, it means that we have to write the wave function in such a way that P i j 1 or P i j symmetric. So I put the subscript S or A meaning for which they are. In the case of the uh, symmetric wave function, in the case of the symmetric wave function, the permutation operator on the symmetric is equal to the symmetric for all permutations. In the case of the anti-symmetric, the permutation operator acting on the anti-symmetric wave function is equal to uh, the anti-symmetric We have an even permutation or minus one times the wave function if the permutation is odd. Yeah. Could you talk a little more about what anti symmetric means as a concept? Because Symmetric is symmetric, and everything would be not symmetric if it was not symmetric. But what does anti-symmetric mean? This is exactly the definition. So it means that for over here, if I make some simple wave function. And say there's three electrons or three particles and three states. If for every possible way that I can swap these, it returns a uh, one, then it's symmetric. And if for every possible way I can swap these, it returns a minus one, then it's anti-symmetric. And remember, this wave function, uh, it's just a function. Right? I mean, we, we saw a particle in a 1D box and we had, you know, like, let, let's say these are non-interacting wave functions. Then we have, uh, sorry, non-interacting particles in an infinite one-dimensional box, right? Then our solution would be sine n pi, some constant, n pi x over L sine n pi x over L sine n pi x over l, and the n1, x1, n2, x2, n3, x3, 
right? It's just some function that we solve. And if we write our uh, wave function in, if, if it's anti-symmetric, then for any time that we swap, so in this case, Q1 is N1, X1. Q2 is N2, X2. Q3 equals N3, X3. For any way we swap these once, it has to return a negative value in front of it, then that means that it's totally anti-symmetric. So it's not a it's not a geometry that's changing. Or it's not geometry, right? it's symmetric under an operation, and this operation is our interchange operator. Okay. And you'll you'll see in a little bit where, where this is gonna go. Other questions about what we talked about? Okay, so this brings us to what I was referring to as, I guess, the zero uh, postulate. And that is that uh, particle that we've ever observed is either totally symmetric, at which point we call it a boson, or it's totally anti-symmetric, and we call it a fermion. So fermions, these are, you know, are uh, electrons, neutrinos, quarks. Uh, bosons, these are photons, phonons, uh, Cooper pair, and many other, but we call this postulate zero because, you know, we can't prove that all particles are either symmetric or anti-symmetric, but we've never observed one that isn't, and it's something that works out because of our, uh, the, relation, the uh, relationships of the, the commutators and our operators. So, what does this mean? Well. This means that when we write our solution, and write a solution down, that we have to make certain that our solution is either symmetric or anti-symmetric. So for example, we, we solved, or we wrote the solution to two non-interacting particles in a 1D box. And we had something like this. And whatever, that was some constant sine n1 x1 over L n pi x over L n2 x2 pi over L, right? Well, this is not totally symmetric or totally anti-symmetric. But we know that if this is a solution, that we can add the solution to itself, or we can add different variations of the solution to itself. So if we were to write this, One in which we have a uh, the uh, x one at position at particle one, x two at particle two, plus x two at particle one, or particle one at x two, and particle two at x one. That produces a wave function which is totally symmetric. So in doing this, we symmetrize the wave function, and this gives us a wave function that will behave like a boson. And 
an anti-symmetric expression would be Operating on XA. Um, I'll change colors again to highlight this. It's, uh, it's the orange, why not? Operating on XA, and that puts P12 operating on those. That gives us P12 operating on. X1, X2 minus P12 operating on X2, X1. That gives us P12 uh, operating on X2, X1. Oh, sorry. Try that again. P12 operating on X1, X2 gives us V X2, X1. P12 operating on X2, X1 gives us V X1, uh, X2, which is equal to negative V X1, X2 minus V X2, X1, which is equal to minus. minus the anti-symmetric. So you can see that operating on it returns minus 1. So this way of writing it will give us what we want. And you can do the same thing with the symmetric one and, and see that it, it operates correctly. So this, this is a pretty big thing because it, it, this whole exchange thing, these particles don't actually see each other. right? They're, we're saying that these particles are uh, not interacting. So the Hamiltonians don't see each other, yet they become entangled. And what's more, the way they become entangled has to do with the fact that their wave functions extend out. And the implication of this is that any time that this wave function can go somewhere and interact with another, another particle, it's going to become entangled. It may be a very, very you know, small amount of entanglement, but it does become entangled. So this whole discussion you'll see in, in some popular science textbooks about quantum weirdness and about action at a distance, uh, this is where it comes from. And there's an article here uh, that I will, I will include here. It's called uh, Quantum Teleportation Between Distant Matter Qubits. It was uh, January 2009. And then basically, they took uh, europium uh, ions and they separated them out by about five meters and they uh, entangled them. So that uh, a, a measurement of, of one uh, became uh, part of the other. And in, in quantum, we know that, that uh, you know, these wave functions, they do extend outward uh, infinitely. So, this is where that, that uh, action at a distance comes from. So let's talk a little bit more about the, uh, uh, so this this symmetric one. Anytime you write a symmetric one, that's simple. It's just a linear sum, right? So if I had, you know, five, five, uh, <clears throat> five uh, particles, I would just add uh, all the possible ways that I could combine them. But the anti-symmetric one is a little bit more tricky to write. And this guy named Slater came up with a trick to be able to express an anti-symmetric wave function. So Slater, uh, he said, let's say that we have a Hamiltonian that's separable from H1 plus H2 plus H n, 
These are non-interacting Hamiltonians. So you know, we're back to our particles in a box that don't see each other. Well, they're not interacting, and that means that we can solve a wave function that will look like, again, I'm changing notation here because in the previous discussion, I needed a simple way to do uh, interchange, and here what I need is I need a simple way to show you that I can, I can break up the uh, uh, eigenfunctions for each of these particles. So what I'm showing you here in this expression, I'm saying that particle 1 is in eigenfunction 1 at x1. And this is particle 2 in eigenfunction 2 x2. And I can swap those back and forth. Uh, so we got these, and these Hamiltonians give us Give us uh, energies and, and eigenfunctions. So what Slater said was that we can write this in an anti-symmetric fashion for n particles as one, the one, <laughs> one divided by the square root of n factorial multiplied by the determinant, the 1, x1, the 2, x2, the n, xn, the 1, x, oh, sorry, my mistake. These are x1. So the top row is x1, 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 c1, 2, 3, c2, x2, cn, x2. So the determinant of, of that matrix. So this is going to be an n by n determinant. And this is uh, kind of the, the short way, or the, the easy way to get this right. So let's, let's write out what one of these would look like. Let's say that we've got uh, an anti-symmetric three-particle system. So an anti-symmetric three-particle system, q1, q2, q3, is equal to 1 over square root of 6 times the q1, q2, q3 minus the q2, q1, q3 plus the q2, q3. Three Q one minus C Q three Q two Q one plus C Q three Q one Q two minus C Q one Q three Q two. Three two one three two three one three two one three one two one three two. Okay. So here, you know, we're saying, you know, parameters one, 
on particle one, parameters two and particle two, parameters three and particle three. Here, parameters three and particle one, parameters two on particle two, parameters one on particle three. So you just drop the subscript for phi? Uh, phi? Yeah. Oh, uh, over here? No, yes, no, no, no. I'm going from here over here to here I did. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah. Are, are the, is it positive and negative because of cyclic and non-cyclic permutations? It's, uh, it's, it's positive and negative because we're taking the determinant. And okay. when we write out the anti-symmetric, remember we had to have those negatives because when we applied the permutation operator, we swapped and then we moved their position. So this is, this is what it would look like if we had three. And what I wanted to show you, which is something that I was amazed when I saw it the first time, and I'm hoping you are too, because it is amazing. Uh, what if we say Q1 equals Q2? Let's say that two particles have the same quantum numbers. So if that's the case, then we say Q becomes 1. That means that 113 and 113 cancel. 131 and 131 cancel. And 311 and 311 cancel. So that comes equal to zero. So this is the Pauli exclusion principle. So the reason that we have this Pauli exclusion principle, which says that no two uh, fermions can have the same quantum numbers is because if they do, then uh, due to their being anti-symmetric, the wave function disappears. That's really cool. And what's really cool about it is the fact that all this comes about because of the way that we are counting, uh, swapping uh, particles, and the only reason we can swap the particles is because classical determinism breaks down. So a consequence of saying that we no longer know, you know, this particle's here and this particle's here, we can't tell them apart, means that these particles have to be either symmetric or anti-symmetric, and if they're anti-symmetric, they can't share quantum numbers. It knocked my socks off when I heard it the first time, but uh, 